Good morning, and welcome once again to our studies in the book of James. Let's turn into the book of James. Let's read our passage together this morning. Would you please turn with me to James chapter 2, verses 8 to 13. James chapter 2, verses 8 to 13. Let's read God's word together. If you really fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law, but fails on one point, has become accountable for all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and act. So act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty, for judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Let's just come together in a word of prayer. Let's pray together. Father, we bow before you once again to give you thanks for the opportunity you present us to turn into your inerrant and infallible word. We thank you, Lord, for our time together, and we thank you, Lord, that you are the God who cares and sustains us by your grace. We pray, Father, for those who govern us, for those locally, for those nationally. We just pray, Father, for guidance and wisdom for them as they try to guide us through safely through this particular pandemic. And we pray, Father, for them as they seek to bring forward solutions in order to keep us safe, in order to restore the economy, in order to build up employment once again. And we pray, Father, for them who know you not in particular, who are in places of authority. We pray, Lord, for the movement of your spirit in their hearts and their minds, that they would come to know you as Lord and Saviour and thus look to you for the right discernment and guidance in reaching decisions for the betterment of the people. We remember, O oh Lord, the difficult days we live in. It seems to be endless, repetitive, problem after problem arising. And yet we know, Lord, everything has a time and place and we are in your hands, and in your hands is the safest place to be. And we thank you, Father, for the grace and love and mercy shown to us in your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, that in and through him we not only have grace in this life, but eternal love to come in the life to come. For there we shall see you face to face and rejoice with the whole of eternity the eternity of all your people, <clears throat> angels and people alike, gathered round the throne, praising you and the Lamb that once was slain. But Lord, we acknowledge our wickedness and our waywardness. We confess, O oh Lord, we've sinned against you as we've sinned against our brethren. Forgive us our perverse ways. Forgive us and wash us in the precious blood that was shed at Calvary's cross for sinners like us. Forgive us, we pray, that we may go forth knowing that you're with us, knowing you're leading us, knowing you're guiding us, that we would do all things to bring you the glory through your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we ask these things. Amen. This morning we are looking at God's law. In a sense, this is a 
different kind of thing that we're used to because we're so used to the law of human law, the law of the courts, the law of the land. So this morning we are considering to not be above God's law. And we see a great deal of that in the world today. Indeed, in January 1994, Jane Brown, head teacher of Kingsmead School in Hackney, stopped her pupils from seeing a Covent Garden production of the Royal Ballet's Romeo and Juliet. Why? Because it was about heterosexual love. My, oh my. And then in that same year, Mersey side, the Liverpool Council, decided that certain words were not politically correct. Headmaster, invalids, non-whites. And also in Haringey in that year, books about homosexual parenting were placed on the shelves of children's sections in their public libraries. Political correctness has moved on considerably from 1994. And of course, it has its origins in the laws of one man in particular, Karl Marx, who's inspired much of what we have today with political correctness, with no platforming, wokeism, anything that is offensive. It all has its origin deep rooted in the works of Karl Marx. Now, he didn't invent political correctness, let's be clear about that but he certainly is the man who's influenced it. And he is the man who will, of course, have answered for that before now. So this morning, as I said earlier, we're taking a brief look at God's law. Firstly, the royal law. Secondly, accountability. And thirdly, the law of liberty. Firstly, the royal law. Please look at verse eight. If you really fulfill the law, royal law, according to scripture, you shall love your neighbour as yourself. You're doing well. At one point during the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II, a Bible was handed to her by the Archbishop of Canterbury, Geoffrey Francis. He said to her, Our gracious Queen, to keep your majesty ever mindful of the law and the gospel of God as the rule for the whole of life and government of Christian princes, we present you with this book, the most valuable thing that this world affords. Then the moderator of the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland, James Pitt Watson, said to the Queen, Here is wisdom. This is the royal law. These are the lively oracles of God. So when we hold the scriptures in our hand, we are holding a book which has as its source the royal author, God, the one true living God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And when we open up the scriptures and read it, it is God who is speaking back to us. Scripture speaks. It is God who is speaking to us. And therefore, when we pick up and read the inerrant word of God, we are seeing what God ordained to be written for the good of our souls, for the good of our well-being, for the good of society, and for the good of all in coming to terms and knowing his son, Jesus Christ. James uses the words, the royal law in verse eight. Now that word royal could also be translated as supreme or governing. And the particular royal law that James focuses on is that from Leviticus 19 and 18, where it says, love your neighbor as yourself. You'll probably remember when an expert of the law, that was a scribe, posed this question to Jesus. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And the Savior replied, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your mind, this is the first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments 
depend the law and the prophets. Of course, the question that was put to the Saviour was not a new question. It was one that had been debated for centuries. And in Judaism, the scribes had documented 613 commandments in the law. Of these, 240 were positive and 365 were negative. Now, no person could ever hope to know and fully obey all of these commandments. So to make it easier, what they did was they gave them names. So the experts divided them into heavy or important commandments or light or unimportant commandments. So a person could major on the heavy or the important commandments and not concern themselves about what would be light or trivial. Of course, the fallacy of this approach is quite clear. You only have to break one law, be it heavy or light, to be guilty of breaking them all. And that's exactly what James says here in verse 10. He says, for whoever keeps the whole law but fails on one point has become accountable for all. Jesus, in his encounter with that scribe, quotes from the Shema, which is a statement of faith that was recited daily by every Orthodox Jew and is still recited by the Jew of today. It begins, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And what Jesus was saying to that scribe, Love for God cannot be divorced from love for one's neighbor. So Jesus also quotes alongside the Shema that passage from Leviticus 19 and 18 and puts it on the same level as that great Orthodox document of the Shema. Now Calvin saw this centuries ago when he wrote, obviously, since men were born in such a state that they are all too much inclined to self-love and however much they deviate from truth, they still keep self-love. There was no need of a law that would increase or rather enkindle this excessive love. Hence, it is very clear that we keep the commandments not by loving ourselves, but by loving God and neighbour. Understand when it says royal law in verse 8, it is the royal law of love because it was given by the King of glory, the one true living God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It was given by him, therefore it bears the full authority, the weight of his authority in every sense. It is given as the royal law of love. Now, the system of moral values, which guides the thoughts and actions and loves of believers, are, of course, the Ten Commandments. Do you know them all? Listen, you shall have no other gods before me. <laughs> Here in dear old Britain, and I said they, across the pond in America and Canada and down in Australia and New Zealand, everywhere where English is spoken and where there's Christianity, this particular one, you shall have no other gods before me. I guarantee if I went out and took a straw poll of a hundred people or more or thereabouts in and around the streets of Inverness, I could guarantee that I'd get a diversity of opinions on who this God is. What we have here is because people have lost track of going to church, of reading the Bible and understanding what God's ways are, what they have here is we have more gods than the pantheon of Hinduism. People like to have gods in their own image and likeness. I think God is, and I don't think God would do this. Oh, really? Well, you've got a rude awakening coming, my friend. You shall not make for yourself the second one. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness, etc., etc. Really? 
I wonder what people think when they bring out a little portrait of Granny sitting there on the sideboard and say, Granny's looking down on us, you know. Is that not idolatry? Of course it is. You shall not take the name of your Lord God in vain. Oh dear, oh dear. Tots barely able to walk take the Lord's name in vain. It's the very essence of speech today. Not just in the street, but also across television and film. We see everybody taking the Lord's name in vain. Everybody who does will be held to account. And the fourth is, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor. Oh, really? In this 24-7 society? People should not have to work seven days solid. It should be six and a day of rest. Of course, we have to have the farmer milking the cow. That's accountable, understandable. We have to have police and fire and coast guard. We have to have doctors and nurses and ambulance drivers and people to prepare mood, food and so on in hospitals and take care of people in care homes and so on. But these are all works of necessity and mercy and protection. But we don't need to go to the shop seven days a week, do we? We don't need to be going to football seven days a week. It used to be held only on a Saturday. I can remember nobody worked on a Sunday. Oh, well, you'd maybe go to a, an ice cream shop. The Italians, they would have their little ice cream shop open. And you'd find the corner shop open to sell Sunday papers and probably close about one o'clock. Nowadays, you go anywhere and everywhere, it's indistinguishable from one day to the next. And then number five, honour your father and mother. Well, the reason for that being there is to try and instil in children respect for parents, grandparents. It's all part and parcel of building a culture of respect and responsibility. You shall not murder. Oh dear, oh dear, here we go again. People think that's about somebody running along the street and shooting somebody or stabbing somebody. It also means you don't destroy somebody's reputation by bad mouth and gossip. Oh, and here's another beauty. You shall not commit adultery. <laughs> that, that, in this day and age, really. Look at the number of people that are living together. You just have to see me and my partner. <laughs> We're not married. We don't believe in marriage. This is the second or third time around for us, you know. Oh, really? Well, that's called adultery, my friend. You shall not steal. Well, I don't go and rob a bank. I don't go into the supermarket and put a bottle of malt down my trousers and walk out with it. No, no, no. But I could steal somebody's reputation by what I say or what I do. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbour. Oh dear, oh dear, here we go again. And of course, you shall not cover your neighbour's house. Oh, there she's sunbathing. What's she got on today? Hey, come on, get real. All these things are there for our good and they're supposed to be taking care of our lives by us adhering to them. And all ten of the commandments are summed up. The Decalogue is summed up by Jesus saying, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and you shall love your neighbour as yourself, he says. Think about it. And secondly, accountability. Please look at verses 9 through to 11. But if you show partiality, you're committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do murder, you've become a transgressor of the law. To illustrate what James is saying, imagine you're suspended by a 20 link chain from the pedestrian walkway on the Keswick Bridge that spans that narrow neck of water that separates the Bewley Firth from the Murray Firth. There you are suspended about 100 feet or so above the water. 
one of the links breaks, what happens? You fall to your death. You see, it matters little if link number one fails or links two, four, ten fail. The result is always going to be the same. And in much the same way, it is only necessary to break one of God's laws to be guilty of being a law breaker. And it doesn't matter which one we break. We are guilty of breaking them all. We don't have anything set up like minor and major sins in the Reformed faith. Reformed biblical Christianity says sin is sin. And so if you commit one sin, you have broken all of God's laws. No other explanation other than you are a law breaker and failed. And that's where we are in this life. We're failures. We're sinners. That's why we're called sinners. We keep offending God by breaking his laws. One commentator writes, in what may seem to be an odd pairing, James says that to commit murder but not adultery is the same as breaking the entire corpus. These two were not chosen haphazardly, for both represent core issues relative to ethical behavior, specifically the honor we bestow to other human beings. Murder is a clear case of dishonoring the victim, but adultery is as well, because it demonstrates in unmistakable ways that personal, personal gratification is more important than spouse, children, or family. It is for these reasons these two sins are in the Ten Commandments. Jews tended to regard the law as a series of detached commands. To keep one of these commands was to gain credit. To break one was to incur debt. Therefore, they were of the opinion one could add up what you'd kept and subtract the ones you broke. And so what you'd get there would be a moral credit or a moral debit. And that philosophy is common to every works-based religion and has no place in biblical Christianity. Yet sad to say that unbiblical dogma is firmly believed by very many who have professed faith in Christ. They hold to this business that on the day of judgment, the Lord is going to be sitting there at the great assizes with a set of scales in his hand, and he's going to say, there's your good deeds, my son, and there's your bad deeds. Oh, your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds. Welcome to my heaven. No, it's not going to be like that at all, my friends. That is the religion of works. Salvation is by grace through faith alone in Christ alone. There is no other way to get before the throne of grace and that is to be covered by the blood of Christ in order to gain entry to heaven. One has to repent of sin. One has to come before Christ and confess your need of him. It's not about works. It's all about Christ and what he achieved on the cross for our sakes. And God's standards are perfect standards. And Jesus declared, you must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. And God will accept nothing less. We can only be made perfect through the blood of Christ to be accepted by his father. We can't accept that our works will count in our favor. We must be dependent on Christ and his finished work on the cross. Some rabbis taught obedience to just one essential commandment was sufficient to satisfy God. Again, warped, ungodly reasoning that removes the sinfulness of sin and corrupts not only God's law, but God's grace. And of course, many of those who enabled these kind of things to be distributed and articulated amongst the people, they were the ones who didn't see a need for the Savior. 
And that is why they vehemently opposed Jesus and the gospel of substitutionary atonement that he proclaimed and fulfilled. Our salvation is not a matter of keeping God's law perfectly, but of receiving his perfect grace. Likewise, our eternal security is also not a matter of keeping God's law perfectly, but living dependent upon his perfect grace. And thirdly, we come to the law of liberty. Please look at verses 12 to 13. So to speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty, for judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Some may be thinking, hmm, I thought it's only unbelievers who are going to be judged. I thought we wouldn't be judged because Christ bore our judgment on the cross. So what is James going on about this law of liberty? Well, let me remind you, Hebrews 10 and verse 30 says, the Lord will judge his people. And the writer of Hebrews, like all New Testament authors, lived in a period of when the church was persecuted. But what Hebrews 10.30 here is driving at, the greatest threat to the church was from within by some of its number continuing to live as they did before they were coming to church and thus were living as apostates. They were pagans. They were heathens. Their attention and their service to Christ was nothing other than lip deep. It was not heart deep. There was no sincerity. Naturally, a church in such circumstances can't afford to have members who are living like that and thus delivering appalling testimony of a life of wickedness to a watching world. People like that were disenfranchised, were disfellowshipped, they were put out for their heresy. And of course, it's only right that the church expect its membership to be loyal to its head, the Lord Jesus Christ, and that is still true to this day. Those who go to church and don't live as they ought undermines the very foundations of the church and conveys the wrong message to family, friends, neighbours and work colleagues. We read this in Hebrews 13, 17. And this has to do with ministers and elders, let it be noted. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over their souls as those who will have to give an account. Please note, those who are responsible for spiritual oversight, minister and elder, they're responsible for encouraging and upholding the truth of Reformed Biblical Christianity as set out in the inerrant word of God. And failure to do so will result in having to give an account. Now, ministers and elders are not rulers with absolute authority. They are under shepherds, who in the day of days shall be called to render an account of their stewardship of the gospel to the Lord Jesus Christ, the good shepherd of the sheep. And the questions, of course, that are going to be asked along the lines of, did you preach the true gospel? Now, you may say, well, I'm an elder, I don't preach. Oh, but you do. You're responsible for people in your district, the oversight of them. Did you encourage them and teach them in the truth? Did you feed the sheep? From what God says and not from what man says. Other questions will be asked of ministers and elders. Did you make disciples? Did you guard your sheep from error? Did you encourage the sheep to engage in matters spiritual by the example you set? You see, ultimately, all who are responsible for matters spiritual will have to give an account of their ministry to the Lord in the day of days. They will have to confirm what the Lord already knows, and they will be embarrassed if they have lacked in setting forth 
the fundamentals of the biblical faith. But we should note that that day of days will not be a day of condemnation for the regenerate because Christ paid the penalty for their sins on the cross. Therefore, no believer should ever worry about the prospect of spending hell, spending eternity in hell. But we must pay attention to what Paul wrote to Corinth, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. And there at the judgment seat will be the place for the true value of what we've done here on our earth will be made very clear and the motives of our hearts behind our actions will be exposed for all. The Christian must remember that only he who shows mercy shall find mercy. And that's a principle that runs throughout the scriptures. James is saying, the person who makes no allowances for others will find that no allowance will be made for them. God expects that the recipients of his mercy shall show mercy to others. In the Middle Ages, there was a wandering French scholar by the name of Muritus. He was very well educated, but he was very, very poor. One day he became very ill and he was taken to a place where the destitute were kept. There the people cared for him, but they didn't know he was a scholar. And one day the doctors were discussing his case in his presence in Latin, thinking he wouldn't hear or understand what they were saying. And what they were saying was, here was a creature of no value and it would be a waste of money to care for such a worthless man. Muritus heard them and said to them in Latin, Call no man worthless for whom Christ has died. Because of God's grace, like Muritus said, if we are born again, if we're regenerate, if we're converted, if we're saved, if we know the Lord personally, then in God's sight, we are not worthless. Examine your heart today. Is God at work in your heart, changing you, sanctifying you? Or is it just lip service to Jesus with no desire to be changed by him? Is your faith heart deep or is it really just lip deep? Our passage emphasizes the command to love your neighbor as yourself. And in it, there are serious warnings. Warnings because judgment is coming. I hope this passage will not fall in deaf ears. James is not giving a pragmatic lesson on how to get along with each other or get along with the world. For if we live like the world and call ourselves a church, then we're no different to any secular club. We may as well pack up and go home. The Bible is not politically correct. This is not about political correctness. This is not about wokes. This is not about the Black Lives Matter with its deplorable Marxist agenda, which is anti-Christian, anti-society, anti-family. What I want you to see and reflect on is that James is setting out authentic Christianity as it should be lived in the world by those who claim to be of Christ. Remember, the law cannot claim or condemn or control you if you are in Christ. Therefore, if God is at work in our midst, then it will show as we reach out to the community with the gospel of grace. Times are hard. But listen to these encouragement words from Paul. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. 
for the law of the Spirit has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by flesh, could not do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, <coughs> he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Let's, let's pray together. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the honest, open approach of James. We thank you, Lord, that it is a word we have to understand. And we pray, Father, by your spirit at work in our hearts. You would guide our thoughts, guide our minds. That that word of James that you inspire to be written, would not just take root in our hearts, but we'd grow in our hearts in such a way that we would grow in maturity, be more responsible in our matters in attending to the gospel, and so bring you the glory through your Son, Jesus Christ. For we ask all these our prayers in the name and for the sake of him who is our only Saviour and Mediator, even Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, I wish you well for the coming week. Be safe and stay out of any trouble that may come your way. And just remember, our times are in God's hands. God bless you and goodbye for now.